uh, delighted to be here today. Um, and what I'll be talking about is multitasking and the effects of you, on you and your children's thinking, emotion, and social life. So let me start by pointing out that media multitasking is ubiquitous. This probably is a news to you, especially if you watch younger people, Stanford students, et cetera. I live in an all freshman dorm, Otero, and we see kids multitasking all the time there and throughout the Stanford campus. What I mean by multitasking is exposure to and use of unrelated media content. So if you were a student who was doing a uh, uh, paper on Abraham Lincoln and you read things, speeches of Abraham Lincoln and saw pictures of Abraham Lincoln and read analyses of Abraham Lincoln, that would not be multitasking because your brain is really focused on only one task and integrating information, which is something that brains do very, very well. There is a totally different psychology of this type of related media content. But what we're talking about and what you should picture is people, um, let's see, using Facebook while writing, while watching a movie, while watching TV, while listening to music, while on the phone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So unrelated streams, answering multiple chat windows, et cetera. So we're going to talk here about what happens to your brain, the brains of your kids, when they're using this unrelated media content. So how common is this? How typical is it for people to be using multiple media at once? And the answer is the average Stanford student uses three media simultaneously whenever they're using media. That is, they're never just listening to music or just watching a video or just writing a paper or doing their homework, sadly. They're doing at least three things, on average, three things at once. And the top 25% of Stanford students are doing four or more at once. Low, the lowest group, the 25%, are still using 1.8 media. Very, very, very few Stanford students are using only one medium at a time. For tween girls, this is 8 to 12-year-old girls. It's a little better picture, but growing. They're, on average, using 2.25 media simultaneously. And the top 25% are using three or more. So even at a young age, kids are doing multiple things at once. We want to ask the question, what's it doing to them? So we'll first talk about thinking. Does chronic multitasking change the way your brain works? Okay. So there have been lots and lots and lots of studies of what are called in-the-moment multitasking. So for example, if you watch any of the sports channels or CNN, at the bottom of the screen, there's a little runner that has like, you know, other scores, other stuff while you're watching, or news. If you're watching CNN, they'll have other stories, not related content, other content. Turns out, it messes you up. <laughs> that simple. You don't remember what you read, and you don't remember what you heard. So you remember neither very well. It would be much more efficient to look at one and then the other. Similarly, as I tell the students, Facebooking while studying doesn't work very well. It would be more efficient, better for them if they um, uh, did one and then the other. And of course, some more extreme forms of reading while watching TV, while talking on the phone, while etc., is even harder to be successful. But I'm not going to talk about that today, because in a sense, that should be pretty much obvious. It should be pretty clear. If you try to do a whole bunch of things at once with media, you're not going to do it real well. So what I'm going to talk about today is what I think is a more important problem. And that's chronic multitasking. Does your brain change fundamentally, fundamentally, when you do multiple, when you do multiple things all the time? Now, when I ask my kids in the dorm about that, this is what my kids tell me. Don't worry about it. Why shouldn't we worry about it? Because first of all, when it really matters, I don't multitask. When I took the SATs, I didn't listen to music or do anything else. I really focused. And then I hear, multitasking doesn't bother me because I do it all the time. You people who never do it are in trouble. And my favorite, young brains, they tell me, are able to multitask. You, Cliff, it's a bleak picture. Okay. So I was both offended and jealous. Offended that they would think this and jealous thinking, what is it that those kids can do that enables them to so successfully multitask? What is it? Maybe I could learn something from them. I love learning from the kids in my dorm. What could I do? So I decided to 
study it along with my lab. So, the most important part of human thinking, well, there are two most important parts. One is the emotional part, which we'll talk about next. The other is what we call the executive functions, the, the thinking part of your brain. When you are really thinking, the part of your brain that works is up here in the front, tends to be more on the left than the right, but it's the thinking part of your brain. They do executive functions, and in particular, they help you focus on the relevant and ignore the irrelevant. They help you organize your memories, and they help you to switch from one task to another. So brains that can do this do very well. Brains that can't do this don't do so well. And so it's mostly up here, primarily in the LPFC, um, the, lower, uh, the left prefrontal cortex, and there's also some dorsal and uh, ven uh, ventral anterior cingulate cortex, but it's basically the front part of your brain. Okay. So I know this is called classroom without quizzes, but I'm going to give you a couple of quizzes. These are quizzes that aren't really quiz quizzes. They're the tests we use with the undergraduates, and you can test yourself to see how your brain is doing while doing these tasks. So the first one sounds very, very simple. I'm going to show you a group of rectangles twice. I want you to ignore the blue rectangles and only look at the red rectangles. And to make it easy for you, there are only two red rectangles. So when we do study, no matter how many blue there are, there are only two red rectangles. So I'm not asking you to look at a whole lot of stuff. And you're going to see the rectangles to make it even easier for you. All the rectangles are going to stay in the same place. And all that's going to happen is one of the rectangles is going to rotate between picture one and picture two. And all I want to know is, was the rectangle, did a red rectangle rotate? I don't care about the blue. You can just ignore them. Okay? So here's what it would look like if you were an experimental subject. This is all administered by computer, of course, but I'll do it by hand. I'll show you something like this. Then you'd see this picture. And then you see this picture. How many of you think a red rectangle rotated? How many of you think a red rectangle didn't rotate? OK, it turns out it did. I'll show you again. Look to the guy on the right, is horizontal. And in the second picture, he rotates a little bit. OK, we did this. Six rectangles may seem like a lot. We did zero rectangles, blue, two, four, six, but always two reds. Not a particularly taxing task, but what happened? The low multitaskers, people who didn't multitask all the time, were not bothered by the distractors, that is, by the blue. Didn't matter how many blue they were, they did fine, and they did the same level, no matter how many blue rectangles there were. However, the people who multitask all the time, and this was not multitasking, this was a single, simple task. Nonetheless, they were def uh, negatively affected by what we call the distractors, the blue. And the more blue there were, the more confused they were. They couldn't stop looking where they shouldn't look, OK? Because their brains are used to doing that. So even though we told them the most simple of tasks, gave them the simple, you, you can come in, no problem. The most simple things to do, they were all screwed up. Why? Because they couldn't keep irrelevancy out of their memory. They just kept on stuffing stuff in there, OK? They didn't differ in general memory capacity. They had the same amount of ability to remember. But they would stick extra stuff in which there are plenty of chairs in front and scattered throughout. OK. Now, another test. Um, this one is about noticing the irrelevant. So what I'm going to do, let's hope the, the internet is working here. I'm going to show you a little video clip and ask you to count how many times the players in white pass the ball. Let's see if this will work. Looks good. So all I want you to do is to count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Please don't say anything. The, the video is about a minute. Very good. How, how many of you got 16 passes? Very good. OK. How many of you got a number other than 16 passes? OK. Very scary. Um, <laughs> how many of you noticed the gorilla walking by? A little more than half. How many of you didn't notice the gorilla? What gorilla, you ask? <laughs> Let, let's see that again and see what happened. OK? Watch again. Watch again. About half. You guys were a little better than half, but about half missed the gorilla. Let's see it again, just so you know there was a gorilla. Oh, OK. Let's just. Oh, how many of you noticed the, the curtains change color? 
Very few. And how many of you noticed the black player going away? A couple of you. Good for you. Okay. Let's rewind real quick. Watch it again. Okay. That's the gorilla. Literally, that gorilla walked across the screen, <laughs> stood there, banged his chest, and did that. Okay. So, this is a, a famous example of what's called inattention blindness. People don't notice things they're not looking at. Turned out, those high multitaskers were good at noticing the gorilla. Good for them. Unfortunately, they counted the number of passes wrong. So what basically happens is high multitaskers look where they shouldn't, but don't look where they should. And since most of the time you're better off looking where you should than seeing the gorilla, it's a problem. Okay? So their brains are changing. They're more likely to see the gorilla, but less likely to count the number of dribbles correct. No difference in net attention. Both groups attend, but the high multitaskers attend in the wrong place. Okay? So low multitaskers look where they're supposed to look. High multitaskers are much more casual about their looking. So some other studies I won't show you here. Uh, we can show that high multitaskers are much worse at managing memory. Uh, we use a task called the NBAC task for that. I can talk about that in the question if anyone's interested. If you imagine having filing cabinets in your brain, high multitaskers start filing, then they start misfiling, they look in the wrong filing cabinet, their brains are a mess, okay? So now you say, all right, fair enough, but you know, if there's one thing I'll bet you multitaskers are good at, it's multitasking, right? Good, you're ahead of me, right? Because clearly they're practice, they're experienced, they enjoy it, so let's see how that works. So rather than giving them a brutal multitasking task, we gave them a rather simple one, which is what's called task switching, which means how well can you switch from one task to another, because multitasking in the information realm is basically involves not actually doing two things at once for the most part, a tiny bit, but mostly switching from A to B. So let's see what that looks like. One more test. I apologize for that. So this is a test to see if you can switch back and forth, back and forth between two tasks. So what's going to happen is you're going to see the word letter or the word number. Right? After that, you're going to see a letter number pair, like 2B or 7F or 9G. Okay? Simple, see a word, letter, and number, and then a letter, number, pair. If you see the word letter, I want you to say yes if it's a, if, when the next thing comes up, yes if it's a vowel, if the letter is a vowel, and no if it's a consonant. If you see the word number, I want you to tell me about the number. Say yes if it's even, and no if it's odd. Does that make sense? So vowel and even is yes. Uh, consonant and odd is no, and to tell you which one of the two to look at, you're going to see the word letter or number. Okay? If it's confusing, you'll, you'll see in a second it's not as bad as it sounds. Okay, number? Yes, but you could have been messed up that one, right? Because A is a vowel, so you could have said yes for that. But it turns out four is, four is an even number, so you did very well. Okay, next? No, very good. Now, that time we could have caught you, because six is even and, and C is a... Um, a consonant, and note that we switched from, um, we, we did number and then we did letter. That's called the task switch. You're going from number to letter now. Letter? No, very good. Very good. So we just had two letters in a row. Good, very good. So we switched, right? We went back and forth between letters and numbers. That shouldn't seem like an onerous task, right? Because basically, and in fact, what happens? High multitaskers are much worse at multitasking. They're much worse at switching from one task to the other. The thing you would have thought if they're good at anything, they're good at that, they're actually worse. And why? Because they, keep, they can't keep things out of their memory. So they're thinking number, then they're thinking letter. Oh, but number's good to think about too. And now there's another letter, but you know, number, wait, now it's number again, but what about letter and letters and numbers? They're all important. They're all like stuff to fill the brain with. It all seems terribly important and they get themselves bollocked up. Okay, so they're really bad at all aspects of multitasking and all aspects of cognitive control or thinking. Okay, so they basically are much worse at executive function. Now, so I'll talk about a little later in the talk, executive function is not just important for thinking, for solving math problems, for doing well at Stanford intellectually, it's actually more important even than that, although it's terribly, terribly important for that. Executive functions are used in all complex thinking. Whenever you have to make complex thoughts, 
you use the executive functions. Now, why are they messed up? Okay, so we can say because they do it too often. But what's going on? Are their brains doing something different? What's going on with their brains? So let's see. So we went to the fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to see which parts of the brain these guys used. So we had them in the machine, looked at their brains, and had them do these tasks. And so what did their brains do when they're asked to switch from one task to another, when they're asked to multitask? So here are the brains. I don't know how brightly you can see it on the screen. Oh, yeah, you can see it very brightly. OK? So here are the brains, three different views of the brain. This is uh, the top left one is left on the right, and right on the left, I apologize for that. And um, superior and inferior, which means um, top and bottom. So that's the top of the brain, the bottom of the brain. And this is the side view, and this is the, the um, um, overhead view. So these are the three cuts of the brain. These are three slices. So the low multitaskers, consistent with the psychology literature on task switching, use that little white dot. In the upper right, do you see the little white dot on the, the, so the picture on the upper left, that little white dot, that's the part of the brain they're using when there's a request for a task switch, when they have to switch from letter to number or number to letter. See that huge yellow slab? That's the part of the brain the high multitaskers use. High multitaskers use approximately 20 times more of their brain than low multitaskers. And it's the wrong part. That's your visual cortex. So when they get a switch, this is, during, this is a comparison of not switching to switching. Low multitaskers and normal people, that is the people that used to do this before there were so many high multitaskers, use that little bitty bit of their brain in the left prefrontal cortex. And the high multitaskers blast their brain. They just turn their brains into overdrive when something switches. Not effectively, not usefully, and because so much of their brain is active that doesn't help them, they do much worse. So what these evidence suggests is that high multitaskers just blithely use parts of their brain. They like their brains used, even if it's ineffective. That's why they fill their brains with so much stuff. That's why they multitask. Okay. Now, so we should worry, right? Because these are uh, Stanford students. We want them to be good thinkers, sort of why they got here, why you all got here. And um, the fact is that if they multitask all the time, they're hurting their brains, even when we don't ask them to multitask. So remember, look at the total difference in the way they approach problems if we don't ask them to multitask. So now we can ask about emotional development. There's two reasons to ask about emotional development. One is healthy emotional life is benefited when you have a very effective cerebral cortex, frontal cortex. The reason is that the way your brain works, when a stimulus comes in, the first thing it does, it goes through the, the emotion centers of the brain, the amygdala, which also has other functions, but emotion center. And then if your brain's working effectively, it sends the message to the cerebral cortex, which decides what to do about it. People with high social anxiety, or anxiety in general, have weak connections between their emotional part and their thinking part. So when they get an emotion, they can't really process it through. Okay? So emotional development is important. I got interested in this issue of emotional development through a thing that happened in my reunion. It was my, I won't tell you what number, high school reunion. And um, I'll tell you about why I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but the story started with, um, I was in the dorm, and one of the students was sitting around. I said, oh, what are you up to? She said, I'm texting Fred. And I said, oh, you don't have to text him. Fred's right down the hall. I just saw him. She said, I know. So I said, well, if he's just down the hall, why are you texting him? So she said, it's more efficient. I said, you are a freshman, a college freshman. Efficiency is number 800 that you do anything. A freshman among the most inefficient people in the universe. It cannot be efficiency that is driving you to do this behavior. What's really going on? And she said, well, you know, the truth is you don't lose very much by texting. I said, you know, 
I was just at my 35th, oh, excuse me, high school reunion. <laughs> I mean, kinder, uh, uh, you know, kindergarten reunion. Um, and um, at that reunion, a young lady gave me the love letters. I had, it's the worst experience of your life. I hope this doesn't happen to any of you at this reunion. And if any of you were intending to do that to someone else, please don't, please, <laughs> okay? So it was awful. So she gave me the letters I had written her when we were both in, in, in college. And I could stand reading about half of them. And they all talked about how painful it was that we could not see each other. Phones in those days were, there was something called long distance, for those of you who remember those times, where phone calls were incredibly expensive, so we couldn't really call each other. And we couldn't see each other. We didn't have Skype, let alone lots of other things. And so the letters were filled with all this stuff about how painful and hard it was not to be able to hear her voice, see her face, et cetera. And the student very respectfully said, that's really quaint. So I said, that's OK. I said, but you know, psychology tells us that it's really important to learn about other people by looking at them in the face, seeing them in the voice. And then I started looking around. They noticed that when I was young, one of the comments you heard everywhere you went in any social situation, any scene anywhere, was, look at me when I talk to you. For those older alums, you probably remember that. You heard it constantly, not only from your parents, from all adults all the time. And you would just be walking anywhere, and you'd hear some parent annoyingly say to their kid, look at me when I talk with you. You don't never hear that anymore. You never ever hear anyone say, look at me when I talk with you, both because the, the child is doing something with their iPad and the parent is doing something with their iPad and everyone else is on their cell phone, et cetera. And so no one's looking at anyone else and really listening to what they say. And I wondered, does that make any difference? Seems like it should. Or was it quaint? You know, was it just quaint that the idea of looking at someone and hearing their voice was actually important? So we went to study this. Now, why is that so important? Well, the way uh, emotional intelligence is the single best predictor of all kinds of success, obviously social success, but also economic success. People, with, with exceptions of course, people who have greater social skills and emotional skills do better economically, financially, uh, emotionally, socially, have longer marriages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You name it, if you have good emotional intelligence, you do well, okay? And emotional intelligence includes, just to be clear, the ability to understand others' emotions and the ability to manage your own emotions. And both of these come from learning. We are not born with a full understanding of how to manage emotions, how to understand other people's emotions. There's a couple of things we're born to do. But for the vast majority of stuff, we learn by looking at other people. So if you look carefully at other people's faces as you talk with them, you see their emotion. And when you were younger, you were learning emotion. You were learning how they expressed it, how they managed it, how they handled it, et cetera. And the same thing with voices. If you listen carefully to someone's voice, you could detect all sorts of emotion. And you would learn how they would manage and handle their lives. And even body posture. If people are like this or they're like this, you can tell that there's a difference in their emotions. Turns out it's hard. There's a lot of emotions out there. People express them differently. Some people have big expressive faces. Others have minimally expressive faces. Other people do things other ways. Cultures have differences in emotion, etc. It is hard work to learn emotion. But it was work that a generation or more ago, everybody did because there was nothing else to do. That is to say, when you were with someone face to face, you couldn't pull out your phone. Not because you might not have wanted to, but you never would have thought of it because there was no such thing. So if I wanted to talk with you, I really didn't have a lot of recourse. Right? And in fact, I tell my students, you know, for example, when I was in college, if someone came in and said I was very, they were upset, the first thing I would do would be either turn off my music or, I said, or shut, up, shut my book. I didn't do both at the same time. We didn't do that in those days. But I said we would shut off our medium, sit down, turn around, and look at the other person. And that's how we would communicate. Again, something that seems quaint, but was important because we learned a lot about what the other person was thinking and feeling. We expressed ourselves more effectively, et cetera. So what happens if you're distracted when you're interacting with other people? So what we did was, so of course, the answer is simple. If you're distracted while trying to learn something really hard, you can't do it. And in the case of emotions, it's really hard to learn. Now, you're probably thinking, especially if you're older, 
You're probably thinking, I didn't have to struggle hard to learn emotions. It came naturally. But it didn't really come naturally, except in so far as you spend tons of time looking at other people's faces and listening to their voices and watching their reactions and paying attention, and you learned it. So it was natural in the sense you had nothing else to do, but it wasn't something that was built in your brain a priori. So what we did was we did a survey of 3,400 tween girls. Why girls only, you ask? Well, critical age of emotional development for girls is 8 to 12. It's not clear that boys ever emotionally develop, but if they do, it's certainly not 8 to 12. I will tell you my, one of my favorite Otero stories. Um, Otero, uh, up until two years ago, was a famous man witch. The first and third floor were all female, and the second floor was all male. And so during Christmas time, the, the, the women on the third floor got together and decided they wanted to buy their RA a gift. That was, and everybody had to buy a gift that was under $5, and they did a big thing, and they got together with the RA, and the RA was thrilled and happy, and it was touching and all that. Uh, then the, the women on the first floor said, oh my god, we didn't do anything. So they got a huge card, like a massive card, and each, each woman on the floor wrote a lovely message. Okay, the two girls floor. About two weeks later, I'm walking through the boys' floor, and I see the RA's room is filled with garbage. You know, traffic cones, shopping carts, torn up stuff. And, and, and the second floor was a female, and I, I said to her, what happened? You know, and she said, that's how boys say I love you. <laughs> hey, so we are talking about a rather different level of emotional maturity. So we have to look at girls to understand emotional maturity. So, um, so what we did was we did an online survey of 3,400 8 to 12 year old girls. We looked at their media use, their multitasking, their face to face use. So this was actually one of the first surveys to look at both media use and face to face. How often do they face to face? as well as how often they use media. And then we ask various questions about their social and emotional development. And what happened? Kids who multitask, 8 to 12-year-old girls who multitask, that is those who are distracted while interacting with other people, showed negative social and emotional effects. Less feelings of being normal. Why? Because they just don't know what the heck to do. Why? Because they're not paying attention. Greater feelings of peer pressure, more friends with bad influences, less sleep associated in that age group, with a whole bunch of negative effects, both cognitive and emotional. So what was good for them? Oh, sorry, I left out. I should have, sorry, I left out that slide. There was one variable that had positive predictors of all these and even more healthy social and emotional effects. And that was the amount of time spent in face-to-face -face communication. The more time kids spent in face-to-face, -face, controlling for media use. So it wasn't that media is a priori bad. I like media, I'm in a media department. It's that if you spend time face-to-face -face with other people, you learn and develop these skills, you get better things, and we can, to some degree, I won't get into the details, control for cause and effect, that is kids who are uh, more emotionally mature are better at face-to-face, -face, et cetera. Um, being online also had, uh, heavy use of online also had negative effects on emotional development. We're starting to, we have a theory as to why, which I'll tell you, although we haven't, we're about to start studying that, and that is the following. Facebook has supplanted Disneyland as the happiest place on earth, okay? You know what I mean by that? Well, first of all, almost every face in Facebook is smiling. So you would go, of course, sure, my photo albums are like that too, but of course you don't spend enormous numbers of hours looking through your photo albums. But even more, the comments on Facebook have become increasingly more positive and increasingly less negative combined with the fact that clicking the like button, which causes your message to circulate, the message to circulate more frequently, is much more heavily associated with happy things and sad things. Now, why is that important? It's because sad and negative emotions are much, much, much more complex, much harder to learn, much harder to know what to do about than happy emotions. So there's a wonderful uh, quotation from Tolstoy and Anna Karenina, I think it's the first line of the book, that is, which is all most kids read now, because once they've read the first line, the rest of the book is sort of just a waste. And it's under 140 characters, so it's OK. And it says, all happy families are the same. Each unhappy family is unhappy in a different way. Brilliant insight into brain and behavior. In fact, it is true that negative emotions take up much more of your brain power. They're much more complicated, more processing, harder to remember, harder to learn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Happy emotions are easy. So what's happening is kids not only aren't looking at other people to, to get that experience, they're living in a world, the, the world of Facebook, where 
everybody's happy, which means that they don't learn how to deal with unhappiness, which is really what they have to learn. When you don't learn to deal with unhappiness, other research at Stanford by other faculty, um, uh, James Gross and uh, Carol Dweck and others, uh, show that when you, you know, that if you surround yourself, people always believe, in general believe other people are happier than them, but it's particularly acute for people who are heavy online users. So not only do you not know how to deal with negative emotions, you have a belief that you're mu you have much more negative emotions than other people, because after all, they're all happy. They're smiling all the time, etc. Okay, so this is a huge problem. Right? So is there any hope? Because you should be hopeful, the answer is yeah. There's some, not a whole lot, but there's some. The first one is the, for those of you who are multitaskers, use the 20 minute rule, which means if you start to do something, do it for at least 20 minutes before you do something else. Now here's one of my favorite things. I go into companies and people say, oh my God, I can't do email for 20 minutes at a time. I say, why not? They say, because email's stupid. It's a total waste of time. So I said, then why do you check your email every three minutes? <laughs> they say, well, because you've got to check your email. <laughs> Seemed like a good reason, but not quite good enough. So even email, do 20 minutes of email at a time. And if you find it's a total waste, then just check your email less. Right? If, so, so this is a very valuable one. So it's a hard one to discipline yourself to. It's really shocking, and I'm, I'm very guilty of this. I check my email all the time. I'm doing something. I always go, check email, check email. And of course, they always go, oh, what a waste, what a waste. But it's still incredibly bad for my work in the short run and even worse my brain in the long run, which my students remind me is getting ever older, as they stay the same age. It's the single worst thing about being an RF, a resident fellow, I love being a resident fellow in the dorm, but every year, they're 18. <laughs> and every year, I move one more year away. It's just all, I, I love the kid, they're, they're, it's, it's absolutely a privilege and a delight, but that's a lousy part of this, this, this thing. Um, second is strengthen your executive functions. There's all sorts of ways. We're actually doing a course in, in Wilbur College this year where we're giving students a chance to play video ga games, not any random video games, video games designed to improve their cognitive control functions. Because on top of the fact that they're important in general, this is the age where you still are growing. There's the one part of the brain that for college freshmen is still growing. Is the front the, the, the front left and right, which is a part of all those executive functions. So we want to develop them also because we're trying to deal with impulse control. For those of you who were college freshmen, which all of you were, and no college freshmen, you know, they're not so good at impulse control, right? College freshmen are impulsive. It's part of being 18. It's okay, but it would be nice if they sort of toned it down at the margins. And so what we're trying to do is we have re reason to believe we're doing a study with um, people at the law school and psychiatry and a bunch of other departments. We think that if we can build up their executive function, not only will they be better academically, but frankly, a greater interest for us is that they'll show less social anxiety, uh, less, less alcohol issues, uh, less depression, et cetera, because there's evidence that strengthening executive functions has all those positive effects. Third, make face-to-face -face sacred. It's magical. If you actually spend a lot of time looking at people face to face, it really helps a lot. It helps you, helps them, and especially for younger people, it really works well. So one day in the dorm, I told all the kids, okay, today is face to face day. You're not allowed to use any media when you interact with other people. You've gotta look at them face to face. That's the deal, and most kids did. So what happened? They came back in and they were exhausted. And they came back, and they're so smart. God, you know, Stanford, I mean, God, Stanford freshmen are just so darn smart. So they came back and said, one, one kid comes to me and goes, you won't believe it. People's faces, like, they do all this different stuff. <laughs> and like, if you, re it takes a lot of work to really look and discover. You know, he goes like, I found out that, you know, these muscles are used for this and these are, I said, awesome, right? You know, it's just great. And I said, I said and he said, but you know, it was such damn hard work. So I said, okay, but that sounds like you just need more practice. Think if you practice more, you'll get better at it. And he said, yeah, that's probably right. They all came back exhausted. It was exhausting for them because they were out of shape. They essentially had emotional atrophy. 
essentially not muscular. We don't literally, I mean, use muscles in your face, of course, to, to express motion. So, so it's, I, I, the term emotional atrophy is a bit of a, 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 a misnomer. But fundamentally what happened is they don't practice reading emotion that often. So therefore, when they really had to do it all day, it was darn hard, which was great. I thought that was good. So I told them, you know, why don't you try it now and then? See how it works for you? You know, see, it could be good for you. So it's a really important thing to actually spend time being face to face. It's a, it's a very powerful um, thing to do. All right, so I'm going to stop on a high note, which is to say that these are three things that can help a lot, not just you, but your kids, your kids' kids. Um, extremely valuable, especially the youngest kids, right? We, we really want our youngest kids to have healthy cognitive functioning and healthy emotional functioning so that they come to Stanford and you know, be healthy and happy kids. So I'll stop there and, and open up the floor for questions. I don't know the mechanism for questions. I do know we have people with microphones, yes. thank you, who will run around. So if you raise your hand, is that the idea? So if you raise your hand, someone with a microphone will come hurtling at you. OK? I was wondering which uh, videos, your uh, games you're recommending that take care of the strengthening executive great, functions? Great question. Um, they come from two different um, uh, uh, companies, and they were designed with the work of the Stanford Psychiatry Department. Uh, one of them is uh, Lumosity, I believe it's called. And I will try to Lumen, Lumen, L-U-M-O-S-I-T-Y, certain of their games. I don't want to recommend all their games because we don't know, but there are some. And what I'll do is maybe when we post, I gather they're posting this video on iTunes, Stanford iTunes. I'll actually add a link to the, to the, to the games that we recommend. Happy to do that. And we, but I do want to say that this is still experimental research. We're doing the research this year, but we have good reason to believe that they will help your, your executive function at, at any age, including adults. Yes? Great, great question. The 20-minute rule, learning to focus and pay attention. It turns out it's harder than it seems if you are a multitasker to literally really focus on one thing. The practice of focus, there was a quotation, the, the one quotation that hung in Thomas Edison's laboratory was a quote from the 1600s that said, there is no expedient to which man will not resort to avoid the real labor of thinking. That's how they talked in the 16th century. <laughs> but what, what they really meant by that was most people, if they can avoid thinking hard, will avoid thinking hard, right? And so that's the problem. When, when I lived in a world where there were few technologies, I had to think hard. I had to look at the other person's face and voice. I always tell the kids in my dorm, look, if somebody had given me an iPhone, I would have used the damn thing, OK? Because it was much easier. But I didn't have that opportunity. I didn't have that chance. So I actually had to look at their face and voice and learn emotions, OK? And it was work. It was hard. But I'm glad I did it. So the answer is, any activity that requires mental focus for extended periods, any things that avoid jumping back and forth between tasks are all very good for your brain. And what these things do is they're, they're designed to be a little more focused in that regard. But if you just practice paying attention and practice not jumping around, doing 12 things at once with your brain, you will do much better. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, the people in charge of the microphone is, are deciding this. And there's a woman, of, maybe you could get one of these people or something. Yes. I'm sorry. Please. Um, has there been any research done on those of us who are digital immigrants, the older people for whom all this multitasking is relatively late? Uh... Well, you know, great question. So the first answer is it's a case where the digital immigrants or people who are new to, relatively new because of age to technology do better. So, you know, my students always tell me how my brain is declining. They love telling me that. But in fact, because we grew up in a world where we didn't multitask, and where focus was something that was emphasized. So in school, in daily life, there was per a perceived virtue of focusing and paying attention. That was a rewarded and highly regarded trait. So for those people, because our brains do that, we're really good at it. So those, and in fact, we are so good at focusing that when we have to multitask, we're actually better. It turns out among the Stanford kids, the ones who insisted they were best at multitasking 
with the worst. They did worse on all these tests. Why? Because they did them all the time and it screwed up their brain. So it turns out that the digital immigrants, as they're often called, actually are great at this stuff. They don't enjoy it, though. So, so the, the problem is not you're not good at it. If you, you know, if you came into my lab and I asked you to do it, you would be aces. But you'd say, I didn't enjoy that. Why do you want to do four things at once? This isn't fun. This is stressful. This is awful. So, so it's not that you will enjoy it, but you will be good at it. So it turns out this is sort of the comeuppance of the high, smug, high multitaskers who, who said, we digital immigrants are doomed. Yes? On one of these slides, you said that uh, students with high multitasking uh, tend to, I guess, have a proclivity to have friends that are kind of a bad influence on them. Could you talk a little bit more to why that, that's the case? So, so it's a great question. It turns out that um, in that age group, generally what we find is having friends who are bad influence are not in and of itself its own thing. They're part of what we call a constellation of problematic issues. So what happens is, um, for girls, again, not, boys are almost immune to this. For girls, if you lack social skills, you, you tend to be treated much worse. You tend to have a much less pleasant childhood. And one of the consequences of that is you end up hanging out with kids that people don't want to hang out with. So that's why it's a bit, it's not that you seek out evil or something like that. With boys, they just don't notice, right? <laughs> they just don't. So, so another one of my favorite things is when my son was in sixth grade, I, I went to pick him up at school and I saw a group of girls and a group of boys arguing. And the group of girls were about five girls there was this incredibly complex social dynamic. Cliques forming, unforming, challenges, da 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 da. The boys were like, ugh, ugh. <laughs> and one guy says, got football. The other guy says, OK. And they just went off, and it was all done. So it was like cavemen versus, you know, like whatever. But, but it makes life easy. I mean, it's not to say it's easy to be a boy either. But, but being a girl 8 to 12 is much tougher than being a girl, a boy 8 to 12. Boys 8 to 12 just don't have emotional lives in, in a rich way. <laughs> I mean, they do. They, they have, I don't mean they have, no, of course they have emotions. But, but they just don't have a rich emotional life, nor can they elaborate it, nor do they really sense it. With girls, though, 8 to 12, if, if any of you have 8 to 12 year olds or no 8 to 12, that's a tough, that's really complicated. So that's what's going on. They're being more shunned than it is that they're attracted. Uh, I, I can only call on people with microphones. That's a rule. Would you put this talk on the internet so that my 16-year-old daughter, who doesn't always listen to me, can watch it while she's listening to music and checking Facebook? <laughs> only if you promise to make my 19-year-old son listen. No, I, no. I, actually, he's not my. He's never been a, just by by nature. He's never been a big multi. No. So this will be on the internet. Um, do you guys know? It's, is it on? Someone. It'll be on iTunes. Stanford iTunes? OK, I'm happy to put it up there. If you want a shorter version, because kids write short, um, there's, if you search my name, there's a Frontline interview that I did about a year or two ago that's a much shorter version of this. It doesn't discuss the emotional stuff as much, because we were just getting the data at the time. But at least for the cognitive stuff, it, it, it's pretty good. Um, I'll also arrange for the academic. I have a, both an academic version of the, this stuff and a popular version of this stuff, which we can also post. Uh, who, whoever's got a mic? Uh, over here. Oh, OK. Thank you. Uh, what you seem to be saying is this inability for young people to uh, control anxiety is technologically driven. Is it recognized in the psychiatric profession as a disorder? with remedies, with treatments? Is that developing as a field? It's a great question. People are starting to think about it. This link between, it's really a two-part link. One is the link between where does, what are the ways of dealing with, so, with anxiety, depression, et cetera? And one of the dominant paradigms now, not the only one by far and not uncontroversial, is cognitive behavioral therapy. Note the word cognitive, right? So the whole idea is many emotional problems, not all, not all are effectively treated, in many cases by medication, but in other cases by a, a, a type of therapy that says you got to think. 
you really got to get good at thinking before you let your emotions take over. Emotion regulation, these are all important areas. So that's developing. The research that we're just starting to do through fMRI and other things is beginning to show, still, still, still early days, the link between people with these disorders and the weak link between and their, their emotional and their cognitive, right? So between the, the amygdala is sort of way down here, and not way back, it's sort of down, and then the, the, the cerebral cortex out here. So we're starting to see that. And then this third piece is this piece we're doing now where we've just started doing, this is new. I mean, to, the, the reason you go to Stanford is fun to about new stuff. This is like new. Well, the, the studies I'm talking about were done just a couple of years ago, and the fMRI data is about a month old. So this is all new stuff. So, but these pieces are coming together. What are we seeing? What, what do we hear reported more and more? The percentage of students, not just at Stanford, but in other places, with anxiety disorders, depression, et cetera, is way up. We know that. That's known. We know that, that multitasking is growing rapidly, use of technology in these ways. We know that Facebook is a happy, you know, and we know face-to-face -face interactions are going down. We know all those things. We're putting together the pieces, it, but it's very, you know, you can't like do controlled studies where you sort of really, you know, do all this. So, so it's still early days, but yes, many people in the psychiatric community are beginning to wonder about this. It's actually being driven not so much by the psychiatric community as by teachers. Teachers are always the sort of, you know, canary in the coal mine for all these things. So the teachers are starting to say, my kids can't pay attention even when I make them put away the phone, don't give them an iPad, et cetera. And they sort of vaguely call it ADD, which isn't quite correct. That's a clinical disorder, which, which may or may not be, have some relationship. But this inability to really pay attention, this inability to really manage social and emotional life, you're seeing it in the workplace as well. So you're hearing more and more people, managers saying, these people don't know how to manage emotional situations. They lose it. Well, what is losing it? What losing it is means you have this emotion, you feel it, that's normal, but then you don't route it to your thinking centers to say, what should I do about it? So you see a lot more people having these huge emotional, does this resonate at all with you guys? You, you, you see these emotional reactions, and they don't know what the hell to do with their emotions. And, 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 and it's sad, right? And, and what you want to say to them is, think it through. Right? Well, we didn't have to tell people that as much because they had better practice connecting and managing emotions. But another thing we see is there, there's a lovely quotation by, by Sherry Turkle, which is, if we don't teach kids about being alone, we're dooming them to loneliness. And I think there's a more general form. If we don't teach kids to, be, um, to, to, de to understand and deal with emotions, we're teaching them or leading them to be emotional wrecks. It's not that they feel more emotions than we felt. We have the exact same amygdala every generation had, at least for thousands of years. I, I don't know where the evolutionary thing grew, but it's, it's thousands at the very least. But that connection, the ability to say, when I feel an emotion, I now have to process it. But, but here's the problem. If I'm, if I'm doing this while I'm interacting with you, how am I going to learn any of this stuff? We're not like birds where you know, the bird songs are built in. Well, some birds have it, some don't. But, but like, we don't get all this stuff built in. We learn by observing others, by seeing who's successful with it. And there's a large literature saying people who can manage their emotions do better, happier, better marriages, more money, greater business success, blah, 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 blah. And not a shock to any of you, I'm sure. But, it's be, but if we don't learn that stuff, we're not going to get good at it. And if we don't practice it, we're not going to learn it. That's pretty obvious. And so when we move to a world where, here, here's one of the other things that happens. What we see a lot more of is when kids find the social interaction to be difficult, they retreat to text. Okay? Well, what does that mean? That means they're taking the easy way out. I don't blame them. I'm lazy too. And I would, if I was a kid and could have taken the easy way out, high school would have been a lot less hard. Just, okay? But I didn't, wouldn't have learned stuff. So, so the concern is, there's so many ways to get out of the hard stuff, and we can't blame kids. Look, I, I'm sure the vast majority of you, if there was an easy way out, you'd take it, especially if you're a kid, because they're kids, right? That's part of what kids do. 
because they have an easy way out. And social situations are very, very difficult and stressful, right? You know, high school dances, it was all like yucky, horrible. I mean, you know, but, but we had to do it. And from doing it, it made our lives better in the long run. But we didn't have much choice. You know, maybe we didn't go to the dance, but we still had to interact with people at some point. It was all really hard. So if we don't have that practice, we're in big trouble. And if we don't also develop the cognitive, the link between those, where we really pay attention and watch how the people who are good at it do it, right? How do we learn? We watch people who are good at things. But if we don't pay attention to them, we're in trouble, right? That, that, that's a large part of the problem. If you, if you don't watch others carefully, you can't learn this hard stuff. Again, that's not like a deep what is learn, right? You watch people who know what they're doing, and you go, oh, aha, I'll do that, right? So it's not like it's an amazing insight. The, the shocking part is that we've created a technological environment in which you can ignore it. You can get away with not having any of these hard things. So then when you actually have to have them, you're unprepared. Well, if you're seven and you have to have them and you're unprepared, that's OK. That's called the developmental step. Here's, here's another great example I'll give you. So when you take child psychology, you learn about something called parallel play. If any of you have young kids, you know this. Which means that when kids are about one and a half, two, they begin to want to play with other kids, but have no idea how to do it, because it's hard. So what do they do? They move their blocks next to the other kid's blocks, right? And they play with their blocks, and the other kid plays, and that's called playing together. And then they outgrow it, right? So, so the healthy, normal human development is to outgrow that. To, to, so by the time you're three, you then figure out we can actually play together, right? Good. And that playing together, so it's not that it's a bad thing that they play in parallel. It's the step given the ability of their brain to manage it. Fine. Totally fine. Awesome. But then they outgrow it. Now, I watch kids now, 7 and 8, 9 and 10. They get together. They say, we're going to go play with a friend. What do they do? They sit with their own iPad and parallel play. Well, if they were two, that would be awesome. <laughs> no, no, seriously, like, that would be a great developmental step. You're actually going over someone's house sitting next to them, not hitting them, awesome, right? <laughs> Laudable, but by three, you're supposed to stop, <laughs> right? Now they're eight, and they're doing it, but that's how they play together. Well, what are you missing? Why was it important, according to Piaget and all these dudes, that it was actually important you looked at each other, talk with each other, problem solve together, right? All those things, three, right, eight? So that's really the worry. We're creating an environment in which these things, th these activities, which never existed in any human society. We don't know of any human society that has eight-year-olds parallel playing. It doesn't exist. Okay? But now we do. Right? Call, 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 right? Societies with lots of mobile devices that eight-year-olds have. Now, how many, you may think, well, God, how many eight-year-olds have them? Okay? More than 50% of 10-year-olds have a cell phone. Three years ago, it was 12. So it's driving down really fast, really fast. Okay? How many kids have access to computers in their home, iPhones, iPads in their home? I was, uh, kids? Okay? So, so the, the problem is you have this thing that makes life easier. It is much easier. When I was a kid, sitting at that dinner table was often torture because they actually wanted me to carry on a conversation. I'm not saying I loved it. But I learned from the experience. I'll give you just one other story. So I'm invited to someone's house. They said, you know, we've read all this research. We insist that all our kids are at dinner every night. We have dinner together. I said, oh, that's awesome. And they said, would you like to come? I said, be delighted too. So I go to the house, and the dinner starts. Within 15 minutes, one kid has their, their phone out. One kid has this. The father's texting. The mother's doing this. And so I said, look, you know, that research was certainly correct. It was valid. But it wasn't about the, the way that Oak somehow transmits social norms to children. The wood of the table has literally no effect. <laughs> like, the reason people eating together actually develop social skills is not because of, you know, cellulose and xylem and phloem and all that. It has to do with human interaction, face-to-face -face communication. So you're missing the whole point, right? So, so, so that's really the issue. It's just if you don't practice this stuff, you don't get good at it. If you don't get good at it, we know that there are negative consequences. It's really that simple. Is we there, have time yeah. for just one more question. OK, so you have Here the microphone. You're the boss. I'll be around after to sign books and talk with people. So.
So it was a really fascinating talk. And uh, I was curious, you started with multitasking and then went to emotional intelligence and then to executive function. And I sort of see one of each of these bullet points seems to be uh, associated with each one of those three topics. And I was just curious if you have any evidence or uh, research underway to look at which of those is the cause and which of those is the consequence. So, I mean, for example, the use the 20-minute rule implies that if we could multitask less, then we'd become better at maybe executive function or we'd be, be better at emotional intelligence. And then the third bullet suggests if we're better at emotional intelligence, maybe we'd be better at not multi, and so on. So right. I'm just curious, it's, how do we know which is the cause and which is the effect? It's a great question. So what we're actually trying to do now, now that we've got this evidence of the brains looking different, we're actually looking for people to volunteer, heavy multitaskers, to volunteer for a period of time and see if it changes their brain function. But I can tell you something. Finding, finding volunteers is tough. These guys hate giving up multitasking. They hate it. So it's actually very hard. The, these are all hard to study, right? Because you can't like, start messing around with people in these ways. You can do it one direction and not the other. Like I can say to kids, kids, start looking at each other's face, right? You know, I can do that one. A lot tougher to go, stop looking at people. You know? so, so, so these are hard. We're, we're, trying, we're, we're trying lots of different techniques. We're now doing EEGs to see if that tells us anything. That, as I say, this research is really early days. We got a lot of results early just because it's such a big effect. I mean, that's the, uh, that's the irony is these effects are so big, we found them fast. So, so we don't know. If, if you ask me to guess, it's probably a complex combination. So, so are multitaskers born or made? Probably both. Some born, some, you know, is it curable? Probably some, I think. So these are really, it's a great question. These are really early days. We're, we're trying, as I say, we're doing this thing in Wilbur College, uh, Wilbur, the Wilbur dorms this year where we're building up executive control and we're tracking, you know, social anxiety, dream. We're trying. We're, we're just trying stuff. So that's what we're doing right now. We're just trying everything we can. There's a lot more to be done. Also, my own specialty is, is adults, co and not college students and, and up. I don't do younger kids. But we're starting to recruit people who know how to do young kids, which is a different, I mean, I did the survey with, but you can imagine all these things to do with school interventions, et cetera. So we're starting to think about that. It's just not my, I, I've been crash learning all this stuff on kids just because I think it's so important. But thank goodness we're at Stanford. We have lots of kids who know lots about kids. So, so we're starting to work with them. But it's, so it is early days. So we don't know is the sad answer to that question. Well, thank you all very, very much. Thank you for actually not multitasking during the talk. Um, I'll be uh, right out back uh, signing books, but you're allowed to talk with me even if you don't buy a book, because that's part of emotional intelligence. <laughs>